My name is Paul Gilbert, and it's a great pleasure to introduce my colleague Rick Hansen, all the way from California, to talk today on the creating a compassionate world. So if I can just say a little bit about him. Now, Rick uh, is a psychologist and senior fellow at UC Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center. And if you don't know about that, then do look it up on Google, because there are some wonderful things on compassion, meditations, and so forth. And Rick has contributed to that center, obviously. He's also a New York Times bestselling author. His six books have been published in 30 languages and include Neurodrama, which is most recent, Resilient, Hardwiring Happiness, Just One Thing, The Buddha's Brain, and Mother Nature. And I actually got familiar with Rick's work through The Buddha's Brain, which is an extraordinary uh, working through of understanding how some of the concepts and ideas generated within Buddhism can be looked at in regard to neuroscience. So what happens in the brain when you're doing compassion meditations, for example. He's uh, sold over a million copies in English alone of these books. His free newsletter, he has a free newsletter, have over 250,000 250, subscribers and his online programs have scholarships available for those with financial need, which is terrific. He's lectured at NASA, Google, Oxford, and Harvard, and taught in meditation centers worldwide. He's an expert on positive neuroplasticity. This is the way in which we focusing on the positives in our life can have a major impact on our brains. His work has been featured on CBS, NPR, and the BBC, and other major media. He began meditating in 1974 and is the founder member of the Wellspring Institute for Neuroscience and Contemplative Wisdom. He and his wife live in Northern California, which is a lovely place, by the way, and have two adult children. He loves wilderness and taking a break from emails. <laughs> Rick, welcome. What a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to talk to you about the magnificent work you've been doing over so many years. Mm -hmm. So let's start off then. I, I'm very interested. How did you get interested in the Buddha's brain, positive psychology and neuroplasticity? What got you into it? Well, first, let me thank you for that really gracious introduction. And as I've said to you, uh, I just have enormous respect for you, Paul, what you've done, and also a lot of fondness and uh, just pleasure and hanging out with you. Uh, I Briefly, I would just kind of mark it honestly, like for a lot of people when they're very young, I had a deep sense that I can locate in my earliest memories of a kind of poignant, wistful sense of the sadness around me, the anger around me, the unhappiness around me in a relatively comfortable middle middle class upbringing in an intact family with no trauma, no poverty. Um, born into various kinds of privilege as a white male in America. And still, I could just feel that there was a lot of unnecessary unhappiness around me. I didn't know what to do about it. I was three years old. I was six years old. I was 13 years old. But I felt it, and I wanted to do something about it. And that was kind of an impulse in me, and I don't think at all unique in me, probably in many, many people. That led me on my way. I landed in college at the tail end of the 60s, caught the human potential movement. That brought me into an awareness of the Eastern traditions, contemplative wisdom. Later on, I decided I really better get a straight job, and so I went to grad school in clinical psychology and a very psychodynamically oriented, psychoanalytically oriented place, so I kind of got good classical training there amidst a lot of other kinds of training. And then marrying that contemplative wisdom thread of meditation with hardcore Western clinical psychology, starting around 20, 30 years ago, there was a tipping point in the amount of knowledge that had been developed, really, in the field of academic neuroscience, such that it became increasingly useful. It became increasingly practical. And I started really focusing on the intersection of brain science, clinical psychology, and contemplative wisdom, because in the places where they overlap, there's so much insight into the machinery, really, the ongoing causes and conditions biologically that are constraining, conditioning, and constructing our own streaming of consciousness, 
minimally in some kind of correlated way. And so if you have a deeper understanding of what's actually happening inside the three pounds of tofu-like tissue inside the coconut, when you're sad or compassionate, when you're happy or hateful, when you understand more of what's happening in the hardware, then you can start to intervene there skillfully with targeted mental activity, specific, targeted, sustained mental activity that gradually changes your brain, which then in turn gradually changes your mind for the better. So that's kind of the short version of what got me into this. Yes, I mean, that is terrific. But I mean, you were very early in on this. I mean, as you say, you know, you started meditating in 1974. Mm -hmm. And so what got you interested in exploring meditation as a way to move forward? I think by my nature, maybe because I'm, you know, a Libra and a Scorpio, I don't know, but I've just always been really interested in getting to the heart of the matter or the bottom of things. And I think of myself a bit as a plugger. You know, I'm just the, I'm the kind of guy in grad school who didn't say a word in the first half of the semester. And then uh, by the last week, though, I was probably the most talkative person in the class. You know, I kind of steady as she goes, sort of my style. And I just realized that on the one hand, if, if we're interested in not suffering so much and not putting so much harm on other people, putting our own knee on their neck, literally or figuratively, and on the other hand, if we're also interested in the upper reaches of human potential, a, an ongoing deep experience of resilient, realistic well-being amidst the troubles of the world, if we're really interested in that, how do we do that, right? And on the one hand, uh, the contemplatives around the world, I was drawn to Buddhism partly because it's kind of very empirical and very pragmatic, so it's quite alike science in those two regards. Uh, it doesn't ask us to take anything on faith. It, there's a strong focus, especially in early Buddhism, on our direct experience and what we see for ourselves, which appealed to me immensely. But there are other contemplative traditions around the world, including secular ones. Those contemplative traditions, uh, championed really, uh, advanced by the so-called Olympic athletes of mental training, offer us this penetrating, laser-like um, insight into the machinery of our own consciousness. Not so much into what we're experiencing, but the nature of what we're experiencing, which can then, in turn, be really quite liberating. And I then had also a similar interest in depth psychology, developmental psychology, which gets at the roots, the heart of the matter also, uh, for who we are becoming. Uh, I have a near master's degree in developmental psychology and a deep interest in children and families. And then brain science. Wow, if you really want to get to the bottom of how did we get this way? The, your own work has tremendously advanced that through that evolutionary understanding over millions of years of how we got this way. When you know you have a greater understanding of the underlying neurobiology of greed, hatred, and delusion, right? Happiness and, and sadness. When you understand that more deeply, you just have so many more tools for dealing with it. I, I feel like a lot of a lot of philosophy historically, a lot of the humanities, as good as they've been, were a, and frankly, a lot of the spiritual traditions were a little bit like kind of closing your eyes and throwing darts uh, in a dark room. And every so often you'd strike the board and then you'd hear a sound and you'd kind of keep throwing a little more in that direction. But increasingly now by actually knowing more about our, the hardware, you know, the light comes on in the room and we can have a lot more clarity about what it is we're really trying to accomplish. Yes, that's, a, that's a fantastic, isn't it? I mean, what interests me, I think, is the fact that, you know, all of those thousands of years where meditation has been flourishing, but mm -hmm. it's only been comparatively recently that we've had the technologies to begin to think, so what's happening in the hardware? Because, as yeah. you know, a lot of the focus on compassion was really about developing insights into the nature of consciousness and the interdependencies wasn't really about thinking about changing physiological systems. It really was about developing deep insight into the nature of, of consciousness itself and interdependency. So this, this movement towards thinking about how we can understand 
meditation in terms of a physiological process, not just a, an intuitive or insightful process, I think is quite new. And you've been really quite pioneering in that. Mm. And so we've, we've got these two sort of fields really of thinking about compassion. One is in terms of what's happening in the brain and another is what's happening in terms of people's experience of the deeper levels of consciousness. I'm just wondering, you know, how do you work on that? Because it's sometimes said that if you rely on people getting a deeper sense of the nature of consciousness, the stillness of mind, that takes quite a while. But if you can teach them exercises which will stimulate these different neurophysiological systems, that can produce change much more quickly. So, I mean, I'm just, you know, and you really pioneered, in a sense, both of those, but this idea that you can change your brain mm. by what you practice, what you put into it, uh, which I think is just phenomenal. Mm. Well, well, thank you. So there's so much in what you just said there. If you'll bear with me, I, I want to kind of unpack it in two little piles and <laughs> do one pile at a time. So the first pile basically has to do with how does lasting change occur, period. In other words, how do we move from states to traits? Mm -hmm. How do we move from having some kind of a beneficial experience to the lasting change in the nervous system that is the necessary requirement for any lasting change of heart, <clears throat> any lasting cultivation of courage or wisdom or empathy or secure attachment or a larger commitment, let's say, to social justice. How do we actually change, let alone how do we change uh, toward the really upper reaches of human potential in which we become truly liberated from habitual patterns of greed, hatred, uh, envy, hatred, and delusion. And so um, how do we actually do that? One of the things that's really interested me as a both clinician and a meditation teacher and a general teacher in general, in general and a parent is the dirty little secret that most of our experiences leave no lasting value behind if they're beneficial. Our negative experiences, because of the brain's negativity bias, making it like Velcro for bad experiences, but Teflon for good ones, they're privileged. They tend to have a very rapid transfer from state to trait. We can acquire helplessness or uh, feeling bad about ourselves or depression as a lasting mood really quite quickly and readily. On the other hand, we have the opportunity in the ways that we actually engage our experiences at the time to keep the neurons firing together so they wire together, together as well, sustaining experiences of heartfelt connection with other people, let's say, or sustaining experiences of our own worth, or sustaining experiences of forgiving ourselves so that, in part, we have more courage to step into compassion for other people. As we uh, extend those experiences and do other things that I've written about that are evidence-based, and we recently published a page, paper of, about all this in the Journal of Positive Psychology, that as we engage experiences by extending the duration of them, feeling them in our body, focusing on what's rewarding about them, tracking perhaps what's novel or salient about them, really sensing them in the fullness of our own body, we, bit by bit by bit, heighten the neurological conversion of states to traits, of passing patterns of neural activation into lasting changes of, of function and structure. We can do that routinely, and I call it taking in the good, and I think it's incredibly important. Practice uh, uh, with the conditions around us, to me, it really is a matter of three fundamental things. In the language of early Buddhism, metta, sati, and bhavana. Uh, loving kindness, compassion, the heart, metta, sati, mindfulness, sustained present moment awareness, and let's not forget bhavana, cultivation, actually learning and developing uh, and fostering lasting change along the way. Critically important. So that's been a huge focus of mine. And I think a lot of people have had momentary insights, as you say, into interdependence, emptiness, you know, and it's great. But when they get home off retreat uh, and their partner or their teenager does what they do, bingo, they're as reactive as ever. That then takes us to the second pile I want to talk about briefly here, which is that I think there are, in effect, three kind of major paths of awakening or three major elements. One of them certainly is the path of insight, which has been 
emphasized tremendously uh, in uh, certainly the Theravadan tradition of Buddhism and in other places as well. And you see versions of that, especially in Tibetan practice too, where it's great, but a lot, it shows up as kind of conceptual. It takes a lot of sustained time to have those insights really land. I don't think it's accidental that that path has been driven mainly by men, culturally situated. There are other ways to do it. The second major way is the path of love, where we drop actually directly into experiences of warm-heartedness for ourselves and for others. And in the process of dropping into that warm-heartedness, uh, we naturally become less inclined to hurt other people. And we become naturally more um, kind of aware of our connections with other people. Just the path of lovingness altogether, certainly as many teachers have emphasized. I'm not making this up myself. I'm pointing to what other great people have taught about. And the third major path really was identified in the Buddha's drive theory of suffering, that we suffer so much because we get caught in our biology by various drives that lead us to crave crave the ending of pain, crave the continuance of pleasure, crave the, the ongoingness of connection with other people. We get caught up in that kind of craving. And that then, of course, creates suffering and harm. So how do we crave less? First, build up psychological strengths inside that enable you to meet the challenges of life without getting stressed, contracted, and hateful about it. Second, repeatedly internalize the felt sense of needs met enough in the moment so that there's a growing mood inside, hardwired into your own nervous system, of feeling safe enough in the moment, satisfied enough in the moment, and connected enough in the moment, so that the drive states, grounded biologically, rooted in sense, a sense of deficit and disturbance, increasingly have less and less basis, actually, inside us. Habits of craving, habits of drivenness, habits of interpersonal conflict may, may continue, but as we growth psychological resources inside, and also as we repeatedly internalize the felt sense of peacefulness, contentment, and love, one kind or another, again and again and again, then we're less driven, we're less caught up in craving, and we're able to sustain much greater equanimity as we move forward in life. So for me, these are three major ways to do it, and, and you bet, I've really focused on the second and the third inside the larger frame of paying attention to what is your learning curve what is your process of cultivation as you go through life? Yeah, I mean, that's that's terrific. I mean, you know, from our discussions, we argue that, you know, we are all DNA produced and DNA wants to produce organisms, create organisms like you and me with two things to survive and reproduce. And that is where all of these drives and things come from. They're biologically generated. And so the question is that because we have a mind that can observe itself, you know, no other animal, as far as we know, can do that. I mean, mm. you know, lions can hunt, but they don't know that they're doing it. They can't suddenly decide, look, this is all very cruel. I think I've become a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> or I get up in the morning, I've got to practice. You know, we have yeah. a, this knowingness, this consciousness, which Matthew yeah. Ricard talks about, the, the concept of knowingness and how we can use knowingness then to think about, hang on a minute, so if I've got all these drives and things that nature has given me, but they actually can be quite harmful, quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. So now I can use my mind to say, I, I think I'll cultivate that part of me rather than that part of me. And that I think is something that you really also helps us to articulate. Look, you know, mm -hmm. yes, you have these drives and these graspings, but look, there are these other motivational systems as well. And if you choose to focus on that, that will organize your mind in a different way. And I also think that, you know, when you do that, when you organize your mind through what we would call a caring system or whatever, yeah. it gives you a greater sense of connectedness. And that puts you in a frame which allows you then to do the insight meditations. You are yes. actually in a much safer place. And the insight meditations then actually begin to bite for you, they begin to work for you. Whereas if you start from the threat, being in the position of threat, and you're trying to regulate the threat systems through it, I think that's much more difficult. So you know what you're talking about is in cultivate you call it cultivating the good cultivating goodwill to others cultivating benevolence mm -hmm. to others the desire for others to be free of suffering those are such powerful motivational systems in the brain that they do reorganize you know how these other systems are organized so they as you say they you begin to drop away from envy so 
I think, you know, what you've done on that is really important because I think you've brought in the part that it's not just about addressing suffering. It is also about savoring. You talk a lot about savoring in your work, about uh, when things that are important and what Buddhists would call wholesome, how do you hold them? How do you keep them in mind? How do you allow them to do physiological work? I mean, I think that's that's always struck me as a really important insight. How do you savor so that the good can do physiological work? Well, I really appreciate you appreciating it. And you, you know, I'm grateful to you, Paul, because you've been a champion of that. And uh, what's first a point of emphasis is actual embodiment. In other words, for all the yappity yap about mindfulness of the body, many, many spiritual practitioners are lifted off from you know their own body. What's the line from James Joyce? Mr. Somebody lived at some distance from his body. I think that's a paraphrase. And for me, if we actually take the body into account, we realize with a certain humility, I think of it as the humility of receptivity, we're frail. Life is tough. We come into this world, what the heck? We get dropped into these families, these systems, these cultures, these economies, these tyrannies of various kinds. What the heck? We need help. And the help that endures is the help that we've grown inside ourselves. Fundamentally, how do we grow strengths of different kinds inside ourselves for happiness, skillfulness, effectiveness, moral commitments, and so the, and the rest of that. That's it's really a very bottom line thing. How do you how do you grow embodied strengths, really? And I just think it's a scandal the degree to which people in the growth industry, me included, formal systems, clinical psychology, coaching, uh, different teachings and trainings. There's been incredibly little interest in what people can actually do inside themselves to turn the experiences that they're having at the time, often hard-won experiences, into a lasting change in their body. And there's certainly some people who inadvertently grow and change. There's incidental learning. There are teachers who foster certain conditions like high-intensity wilderness programs or you know things in certain kinds of settings that tend to foster greater uh, lasting change in the nervous system. But on the whole, uh, we broadly, as teachers, therapists, clinicians, and so forth, we're really great at helping people to have experiences, and we've been really lousy at helping them turn those experiences into lasting change inside. And so for me, that's, that's really a major theme I've been banging on about. For me, positive experiences are just a means to an end. It just happens to be that the process of growing various strengths is a two-step process. You must first experience it, and then you must, in a sense, internalize it. You must install it as a physical change. All right, most experiences of what we want to grow inside ourselves are beneficial, they're enjoyable. So their enjoyability is a marker of their value. But for me, my primary focus is growing strengths inside that endure, not on having positive experiences per se. It just happens to be that most beneficial experiences are hedonically pleasant. That said, there are key experiences uh, that are really quite neutral, like insight into impermanence. Is a, it's not particularly enjoyable or, or unpleasant. It's just kind of neutral, and it's incredibly valuable. Also, a sense of healthy remorse. Uh, I've been, honestly, a little preoccupied, I'm not sure why, the last couple of days, uh, about a situation I had with a, a high school girl as a, when I was a senior that I initially invited to the prom. And then I was so uncomfortable <clears throat> at, and shy at getting clothes for a prom and being in a dance and so forth that I kind of politely disengaged from going to the prom at all. But of course, I left her you know, it, it was really wounding for her, and I feel horrible about it. <laughs> you know, so I'm, I'm, you know, grappling with that right now. Uh, so anyway, feeling that kind of remorse or remorse at um, things we do with our kids, those are helpful experiences too, and they're not particularly pleasant. So I just want to really highlight this point, Paul, that it's not so much about states that interests me. It's the general process of converting them into traits 
uh, that really matters. And then we carry with us those benefits over time. That's terrific. Um, yes. I, I Thanks for letting me bang on about it. <laughs> we can have a talk about your remorse. That's very interesting. <laughs> so I'd like to move on a little bit now to the next bit, which is you would understand this in terms of bodhicitta, which is okay so that we can do this and we can build these strengths and uh, wisdoms within ourselves. But then how do we bring them into the world, right? I mean, how yeah. do we create the conditions for other people to do, to discover it? Because the key thing is that in bodhicitta, once I become enlightened, then my, my joy comes from enlightening you. Yeah. The idea is that it's these joys that you're talking about, these pleasures aren't about, you know, having good meals and fancy yachts and flying around the world in nice jets, which might be very enjoyable. Those aren't quite what you're talking about. You're talking about more the joys of interconnectedness, the joys of mutual helping, the joys of taking us back to living a little bit more like in hunter-gatherer societies, which I've got your paper here, which is wonderful. So these, these joys then that we're talking about, when you have enough, it, it, when you have insight, they have to become social. They have to become about the joys mm. of sharing, the joys yeah. of seeing others, the sympathetic joy, the joys of cultivating the minds of others, not just one's own. So I'm just wondering, how is your thinking going in in that dimension? Yeah. Um, so well, you've been a champion of that. So part of what's helpful pragmatically. So I'm I'm a I think of myself as scientific, but not a scientist, uh, you know, but I'm still trying to, because I'm really a clinician. I'm pragmatic, I'm a methods guy in the trenches. So if we're interested in fostering greater enactment of compassion, kindness, happiness for others, moral commitments, if that's what we're interested in, one way we foster that is we can reduce the internal friction against it. Okay, so we help people become less depressed, less internally preoccupied, uh, less caught up in addictions of various kinds. Just that is really helpful, Re releasing, reducing the internal friction to it. But it's certainly not sufficient. Second, we can help people literally develop greater trait compassion, trait kindness, trait commitment to social justice, Trait lovingness, trait heartfeltness, trait open-heartedness. These are traits that we literally can develop one synapse at a time, one breath at a time, many little moments, eh, 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 gradually you know, steepening our own growth curve, our own learning curve over time. That's the second thing that's really good. But that's, again, not enough. Now, you, now it's there. There's not much internal friction. The warm-heartedness is really active in you. What helps you bring it out into the world? You know, love out loud, in effect. To that point, one thing that has really struck me is that paradoxically, it actually can help people to be rested in an unconditional warm-heartedness if they make it increasingly in their own minds, a, in effect, independent of what other people do. And to use a metaphor of a kind of Wi-Fi base station that radiates in all directions, if people have a more and more a sense that their kindness, their compassion, their lovingness is about themselves, in effect, um, and it's less contingent on what other people do, then they move through the world from love. They're more lived by love. It's kind of omnidirectional, and people move through that field. And as people move through the field of the lovingness that's independent of what those other people do, we can also respond wisely. We can be, we can speak truth to power. We can distance ourselves from people that are harmful to us. We can call the police. We can enlist allies. We can disengage from no-win conversations. Uh, we can do all those things. Meanwhile, our, our lovingness for them is, is unconditioned. And I think of a friend of mine who spent some time in Southeast Asia, about nine years as a monk there. And uh, I asked him if he met anybody who was really enlightened. And he laughed. He said, well, in that culture, you watch people for years. But yeah, there were some people definitely who were really, 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 really far along. I said, what were they like? He said, well, they were, they were always the same. What do you mean? He said, well, sometimes they were quiet. Sometimes they joked. Sometimes they were serious. Sometimes, you know, they were very practical. But they were always the same in this sense. 
If you were really nice to them, they really loved you. If you were really horrible to them, they really loved you. <laughs> Either way, <laughs> they might they might ask you to leave the monastery because you were growing marijuana in the jungle and that was uncool, et cetera, et cetera, or you know you were pilfering from the box, uh, not allowed to do that. But they wouldn't put you out of their heart, and so that I think that's a very important thing to rest in that sense of good heartedness in a way that's not dependent on what people around you are doing. So I'll pause there and give you give you some airtime here. What do you think about what I've said so far? That's, that's really important, isn't it? Because, you know, you and I have talked about this a few times that um, the, the world is changing to become more compassionate. I mean, it's a lot more compassionate than it was three mm -hmm. or 400 years ago when we had slavery. Women were treated very badly and, and then they're still not treated well. But we are beginning, beginning to have an awareness, you know, the, the issue of uh, how we treat animals, that's, that was nowhere 100 years ago, now it is a big yeah. issue. So we're beginning to become more compassionately aware mm -hmm. and that we actually want to bring um, uh, benefits to the world rather than just to re be self-focused and so forth. The question is, how do we use the kind of work that you're doing to make that available to people, to know that actually, not only are you doing good for the world, but you'll be doing good for yourself if you take an interest in become more empathic. People think, oh, if I become empathic to suffering, then it's going to be terrible, isn't it? I'm just going to feel more miserable, so I've got to shut that all out. But actually what we're saying, isn't it, that actually if you become more empathic, if you become more engaged, if you become more interested in the welfare and well-being of others, actually, actually, this will actually enable you to feel more connected, greater levels of meaning, a more sense of interconnectedness. And so, you know, lifting people's preparedness to become more empathic to the suffering around them and have an interest in doing something about it, even in a small way, is really quite an important social movement. We have to create the social movement to say, look, we, we don't just want to focus in our own backyards. We do actually want to think about, can we make contributions to others? Um, you know, climate change is another example, isn't it? Where people realize we've got to make some changes here, otherwise we're going to be suffering. So all of the work that you do in terms of generating these minds that can appreciate these issues, the question is how do we facilitate in these individuals to actually go out and, and grab the net and say, yes, I want to do, I want to do something <laughs> to bring compassion into the world. <laughs> well, it's... As you, as you and I know, it's a question that has preoccupied both of us um, for many, many years, and we've talked about it together. First, I do think that, you know, to borrow Maslow's hierarchy of needs a bit, when people are feeling like they're running on empty, running for their lives, uh, really upset, in a lot of pain, flooded with negative emotions, it's a very rare being who has the mental training still to keep their heart open and loving toward others. It's possible. There are magnificent heroes of that who can do that, but most people can't. It's hard for me, certainly. So truly, helping people do what I call living more from the green zone in a realistic sense of not feeling so much that something's missing and something's wrong inside, but you're approaching life more on the basis of fullness and balance, resilient well-being, that creates an enabling condition for a compassionate world, but it's not a sufficient condition. Second, I do believe that there must be a moral component. There's no shortage of people in it, you know, around the world, particularly people of great wealth, who live very comfortable lives and who've, you know, done a fair amount of therapy and uh, they have some kind of regular yoga practice or something. And on the whole, they still could not give a damn about other people. So it's not just enough to develop fairly high levels of personal well-being and internal an internal sense of being unhindered by you know, negative preoccupations, there must also be an ethical dimension. That's certainly as the Buddha taught, he started there. He began with the dimension of, of virtuous conduct. And so I think that's really important to be able to talk about morality. And then that moves us, as I've done recently in these talks I've given in my Wednesday meditation online program, about the principle of non-harming extended in broader ways. And one of the major ways that we participate in systems of harm is we externalize our costs onto other people. 
which is a term from economics, but it's a way to think about what we do. We dump our litter in the street, we dump our anger on other people, or more broadly, we dump our carbon in the skies, or we dump our contagion on other people because we can't be bothered to wear a mask inside a crowded room. And um, so as people become more morally committed, they start thinking more about systems of harm, including, let's say, the non-human animals that they are participating in, or ways in which their own advantages, I say that as a white male, um, are acquired through disadvantaging others. I mean, there's the luck of the draw, I'll call that privilege in some sense, you know, just the genetic lottery, intelligence, place of birth, and so forth, but then there's advantage. I'm advantaged as a white man in America through disadvantaging people of color and, and women and other systems as well. So we start paying attention to that. So I think that's really important. Beyond that, I think that there's no replacement for mass action. You know, I came of age in the 60s. I, I really watched collective action make enormous sweeping changes in America, which I think have also rippled out into the rest of the world and comparable changes happened elsewhere as well. Environmentalism, gay rights, women's rights, uh, citizen involvement in government, um, things like that, uh, you know, paying attention to animal rights, again, the genesis in the 60s. So maybe we'll start segueing here into what we can do in a, in a way that organizes us together so that we can have more and more of a shift into a, you know, a caring and sharing kind of society, as you put it really brilliantly in your magnificent review paper on this. Um, how do we, in other words, build on, to sum up, the internal practices that can lead us to a stability of resilient well-being combined with moral commitments, particularly related to both non-harming and the promotion of benefit, both the, both the, you could say, the negative and the positive forms of moral, of morality. And third then, bring that into collective action that's sufficiently powerful to stand against the incredibly powerful forces of wealth and power that have run the world for the last 10,000 years for the benefit of the few and the harms to the many. Yes, I mean, that because you and I both agree on that very much, don't we? I mean, you know, since agriculture, basically, we've been living in terrorist states. I mean, if you think yeah. about the Romans, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, you know, you can go on and on. Can't Game you? of Thrones. Yeah, that's right. In the Middle Ages and in Britain, you know, if you look at some of the terrible factory conditions and so on and so on. And, and but anyway, we won't go into that because that's what <laughs> that's what about bugbears. But the other thing I think is quite important is when you talk about the recognition of privilege. Mm. I think the most important thing is here is not to slink away into the shadows of shame. So oh, no, I'm a privileged man. To say actually, in a way, I should be grateful to that. Number one, and also number two, that gives me huge responsibility. I now have mm. a responsibility. If yeah. I've been given a position of power or privilege, I have a responsibility to use that to do good, not to slink away in some kind of shame state, but actually to stand up and say, "Yes, yes, that's true." You know, I didn't necessarily choose it. I was born into this. I'm very lucky, but now I want to use my position yeah. to be helpful to others. How can we be helpful to others? And I think that's something that's really quite important to be clear because otherwise there's a lot of shaming and devaluing going on which doesn't do anybody any good how can we use the powers that we have to do exactly what you say to minimize harm and, and promote the good and i think that's a really important thing and that brings us to the next point that you're saying which i know is a very important issue for you is how do you produce compassionate communities that can operate yeah like alliances that can operate like interconnected networks of individuals who all share the same basic values that actually we've all found ourselves here. No one chose to be here. We're here for 30,000 days or whatever it is. Along the way, we may do harm or we may have harm done to us. We may get diseased and at some point we're gonna die. So yeah. why don't we think, hmm, maybe if we work together, we can make this life a little bit better. So how do we create these interconnected networks? Yeah. What, what would your view be about creating interconnected networks of compassion oriented individuals? Yeah, it's just wonderful to talk with you, Paul. And, and again, people 
maybe don't quite realize what incredible contributions you've made uh, related to compassion focused therapy and, and the whole larger frame of it, uh, including in a very scientifically grounded, extremely intelligent, academically solid uh, understanding of the evolutionary forces that have, that have shaped us today. Uh, I think there's a line from William Faulkner, uh, something like, the past is not even past. You know, it's present. It's here with us today. And I also think about one of, one of the great writers to come out of Great Britain, George Orwell, who said something like, to see what is in front of one's nose takes a constant effort. We are the proverbial fish living in the water. We don't quite realize it, how bizarre uh, the ways in which much of society uh, proceeds in contrast to our hunter-gatherer history during most of our 300,000 year ter term so far, anatomically modern humans, with another couple million years before that of tool manufacturing pretty intelligent hominids, right, in hunter-gatherer bands. So, so here we are. I want to say first that about privilege or advantage, for me, it, where it becomes personal is I look out into my house, my home, and I think about, in simple terms, you know, the money that I have, and I ask myself, what fraction of that is based on virtuous effort over the years? What fraction of that is based on uh, the luck of the draw, genetic talents of different kinds? And what fraction of that is acquired through systems of advantage that disadvantage other people, ill-gotten gains, ill-gotten gains. And it's not zero, it's not 100%, but what fraction of the money in my savings account or what fraction of you know, the worth of our home uh, is based on ill-gotten gains? It's a very humbling question and it's one that actually kind of grips me and I'm still engaged in thinking about what to do about it. I mean, um, societally, certainly I would absolutely vote for significant reparations for uh, African Americans and sort of Native people, and I'd be very open to thinking about other kinds of reparations as well, to do something, not perfectly, but something in the direction, substantially in the direction of leveling the playing field and, and rectifying systems of disadvantage. So for me anyway, that's just a helpful way to think about it. Um, there is talent, there is luck, there is drive, and there is advantage. And that advantage, ill-gotten gains, uh, is something to really stare hard at. So, oh, part absolutely, one. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's why we have more responsibility. Yeah, huge, that's right. Huge and it's hard to, you have to open your heart to it and, and to realize that you didn't create the systems that advantaged you, but you know they've advantaged you often in subtle ways in the larger competition with other people. Doors that were a little more ajar for you than for the black person next to you, equally talented, you know, conferred an advantage that accumulated over time. Okay, all that said, uh, you're no, going to let me rant. Important because, as you know, we talk about this. My feeling is that. Because if people experience shame about it, then that's yes. a tricky one. But if they can experience grief about it, to cry for the person who was disengaged, yeah. disenfranchised, to to empathically connect, and I, yeah. what would happen? You know, if you think about slavery, what would it have been like if that was my family? If I saw my wife put into change, if I saw my children put into change and thrown over, what would it be like if it was me? You see, just do that one thing. Don't get into all this issue of yeah. shame because that isn't going to do anything. Get into the process of empathic identification with what's happened and think if that were me, if that were my wife, if that were my child that was put into slavery and I saw them whipped, what would that be like? You know, so that's part of what um, we need to do with compassion is not to go around shaming and blaming, but actually to say, look, walk in the shoes of the other. Because then if you do that, that will open up your ability. So this cannot continue. This must not continue. This must be stopped because you have this empathic connection to the horror of what went on rather than thinking, oh, I'm a, this sort of person or whatever. So that's, I think that's a really important issue. Just let us be empathic to those who do not have. Yeah. Let us think about how can we actually move towards providing and helping and supporting. So coming towards the end of our what well, fascinating talk now so we're thinking about how we create these interconnected networks of individuals because yeah. politics really have just got lost haven't they they're just 
you know, slinging matches and mud slinging matches, really. But there is an issue about how do we create kind of political discussions where people think that we need to start to cooperate. We need to start to listen to other people. We need to start to think about how do we come together to have mutually under, understanding each other and have cooperative solutions rather than just you're bad, I'm good, you're bad, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, again, like you, like I, I am a clinician or, and a methods person and think immediately, huh, what would make it, what would make it better? So I think about psychological strengths. I also think about conditions in groups that would make broadly politics better governance better. Uh, what's gone so wrong in the last 10,000 years is the accumulation of wealth and power that has served a few and harmed many. How did that actually happen? And as you know, I've written a, a very accessible brief paper on it. Um, it's actually available now at my website, um, you know, Healthy Human Politics. During and, Healthy Politics, yeah. Yeah. And if you think about um, hunter-gatherer bands or any group of people, 40, 50, 60 people living together most of their lives, that's our template for effective decision making, politics and sharing resources and making decisions. That's what politics is about fundamentally. Um, the three conditions were present in those hunter-gatherer settings that are no longer present today. Those three conditions were common truth, common welfare, and common justice. In a nutshell, when you're living together year after year after year, it's clear what's really going on. Second, your welfare is bound together. If someone falls down, that drags the group down. If someone is benefited, that pulls the group up. Uh, third, there's common justice. Yes, there are hierarchies, certainly in hunter-gatherer bounds, as best we can tell from those that are still present in the world today or that, or that have been studied over the last couple hundred years, but they're fairly flat. And if a leader, a hunter, a shaman, a chief, whatnot, is a real serious asshole over time. Things happen, you know, people leave, they whoop on them, they nominate somebody else. They're, you have to live with it. You have to face the people you've hurt every day. Uh, and you're bound to them through ties of kinship. Okay, common truth, welfare, and justice. Those are the objective conditions that constrained um, some of our more brutal tendencies, which then had free reign against them, those other bands that humans competed with, often very aggressively, cruelly, and violently. But within their band, their politics, their decision-making, their sharing of resources was constrained and um, supported by these three conditions, which were then lost when surpluses began to develop, as you well know, right. with uh, farming and herding, uh, the agriculture broadly, uh, which then enabled larger con you know, concentrations of human dwellings and then growing elites, which then perpetuated um, you know, their wealth and power over time. So the question becomes then in the 20th, 21st century, how do we change that? How do we reestablish the conditions of common truth, welfare, and justice? Certainly in the kind of sort of democracies, and that's a fuzzy word, you know, air quotes around it, including in my own country, in which there's some very serious attacks on democracy uh, from essentially white nationalist, um, you know, quarters uh, who just are really happy about authoritarianism. Uh, you know, what can we actually do? And for me, um, I think of, um, I have a great prescription, I have a great diagnosis, and an incomplete prescription. The diagnosis is we need to reestablish, even at a moral level, as a bedrock principle for politics at any level, whether in a board, a community, a state, a country, a world, common truth, welfare, and justice. That's a very clear diagnosis of our issue, and I think it's right. And your, your diagnosis is very, very similar. The movement from caring and sharing to, what do you call it, controlling and holding, right, mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a basis for politics. Uh, the thing that strikes me most is the necessity for the many to organize and stand up to the few. Not violently, but through the sheer force of numbers, we must band together to make a difference. Otherwise, it will be same old, same old for the next thousand or 10,000 years. And so how do we band together? And one of the ways that we could do that is for good-hearted organizations of various kinds 
to really, really band together. Nonprofits at different scales, whether it's a small nonprofit like my nonprofit or your nonprofit, NGOs, or larger ones. What's striking is that highly capitalistic business organizations, companies, compare, compete fiercely at the marketplace level, but cooperate intensely and effectively at the political level in all kinds of ways, both uh, legal and corrupt. And yet, nonprofit organizations are typically very friendly with each other, you know, just interacting at kind of the street level, but almost never pool resources in any significant and sustained way for collective action sustained over years at the political policy level. And I think that's a real opportunity for us, a real opportunity for thousands, maybe millions of nonprofit organizations around the world to commit to some fundamental principle like the climate crisis is a very compelling issue. Uh, there could be other ones related to the fair treatment and education of girls and women that would, by their very nature, those very emotionally compelling issues would lead to the reestablishment increasingly of common truth, welfare, and justice as a result of that kind of large-scale pooling of resources and commitment to change over the course of a single generation. And I would love to see that happen. I would love to see that happen. And I think it's shameful, frankly, that good-hearted organizations are, you know, they're involved with their own personal piece of the puzzle. But the ground conditions, the ground conditions of human society in terms of uh, concentrations of wealth and power um, have not really changed very much at all. Uh, certainly over the last several hundred years, definitely not over the last several decades. I think that's a fascinating, uh, I hadn't thought about that. That's really interesting that the this high level co co cooperation at the level of the political um, thing. I mean, at the climate change conference, I guess who all the lobbyists were. <laughs> Most of the lobbyists were all from the fossil fuels, weren't they really? So that's quite yeah. fascinating, really. So this is really quite an important theme that you, uh, you, you're talking about is about how do we generate these cooperative relationships between multiple organizations that are that are compassion oriented. I mean, you and I have also talked about the fact that, you know, how can we gradually move money out of politics? Yeah. Because politics are basically funded by those individuals and whose interest it is to keep the status quo going. So they're funding politicians or political systems to maintain their privilege. That's very clear, I think. So how yeah. do we do that? And I think that's a key thing. I would also like to think that places like the European Commission and the United Nations would think about actually having an orientation towards creating a compassionate world. They should yes. like to see that as a basic orientation of this is what we need to do. We need to be able to address suffering in the world. That's what we want to do. We want to come together to address suffering, to pr promote social justice. And I think when some of the bigger organizations and even governments actually take that on as a, as a motive, as a name, as a project, uh, because of so much suffering in the world, obviously, isn't there? But that is what we will do. We will do what we can to address suffering and reduce suffering. And we will find the indicators to indicate whether we are succeeding or not succeeding. I mean, that's something that I'm is very close to my heart. I get the big institutions to make compassion a primary mission of that organization. So yeah. how we can bring people together in these uh, compassionate um, um, systems like the Greater Good and the Compassion Life Foundation and you know various yeah. others to actually orientate. This is what we want from our organizations, whether you're a business, whether you're a government, whether you're a United Nations organization, everything is around. We will prevent suffering and we will promote the good wherever we can. So, you know, I think that's what all of us have got to orientate ourselves towards. And that's why it's so great to have you on the program with us, because you're yeah. a member of helping us do that. Well, I know we're finishing up. And um, so I'm a psychologist. Mostly I work at the individual level. That said, Karl Marx was right. 
No, the objective conditions, the means of production, the larger systems have an enormous impact. And I think about the wide range <clears throat> of good-hearted organizations that encourage individuals to be kinder, more compassionate, more mindful, nicer. Good, 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 good. I look at my country, America, and I've lived through a tremendous surge of humanistic psychology, East-West consciousness, Oprah Winfrey, much more awareness about uh, being kinder and nicer and so forth. And meanwhile, in the last 40 years, we've seen a very sustained effort to develop minority rule in America that's the heart of which are white evangelicals uh, who really, really want to hold on to their position of privilege and advantage and, you know, in a very kind of strange and, and moralistic way that isn't actually very moral. So even though there's been a lot of individual level good-heartedness, at the political level, it's been just squeezed to the sides. Right. And it, so I think we need both. In other words, I think we need individual scale I, I think we should create a pledge, basically, and people have either declared themselves individually for the pledge or not. And the pledge would be simple, it would be secular, it would be something, what are your vows? You know, I vow to hold others in my heart. You know, I vow to be aware of my impact on other people. I vow to uh, have the courage and the wisdom to be sensitive to the suffering of others and move into effective action, building on a lot of the ways you talk about it and think about it. So I think there'd be a place for that kind of a pledge. And you would just sort of find out, is a person committed to that pledge? Doesn't mean you have to be perfect or a saint. It's not religiously saturated. It's independent, it's as secular as you wanna make it, but you stand for that, you stand for that. And you can tell quickly who stands with you for that. That would be helpful to have a very clearly stated, what's the pledge? Okay, great. And you know, modify it or tweak it depending on different cultures and languages. At the more institutional structural level, think of four major issues that all good-hearted organizations have a stake in, but don't act collectively toward. Uh, uh, true democracies, promoting true democracy and civic society, civil society, major interest. Without democracy and civil society, no way. Are we going to have a compassionate world? Second, corruption, addressing corruption. Corruption destroys compassionate worlds. Uh, Anti-corruption, major interest. Car decarbonization, uh, want to have compassion for the next thousand years for the generations to come. You know, quit dumping fossil fuels and other greenhouse gases into the sky. Huge issue. Or fourth, uh, the empowerment and justice for girls and women educating them, including in developing countries um, around the world. Major, major, major. Again, with that, you start having the possibility of a compassionate world. Without the full respect and support for girls and women, you don't have a compassionate world. Any one of those would be great for a variety of good-hearted, do-good, or non nonprofit organizations to, to organize resources around and pool resources around, you know, helping there be a sustain change in that particular area over time. That would be great. And without that though, you know, without democratization, without anti-corruption, without addressing climate change, without honoring and supporting girls and women, it's going to be really, really hard structurally to have a significant increase in the compassionateness, you know, of our world. I, I couldn't agree more. And I also think that we begin in the schools. We begin. Yeah, great. Good because place. You and I grew up where we knew nothing about the human brain. I knew a lot about history and geography, but yeah. not a thing about my mind. And what's interesting now is the movement for compassion and mindfulness is just beginning to ebb into schools. And we're just beginning to see some of these things, some of the work you do, for example, beginning to yeah. come into the schools. And that has to be one of the great hopes for the future that children will understand the nature of their minds will understand what it is to be empathic what it understand what it is to be compassionate 
And the other thing that both you and I agree with is the media, because the media is what destroys democracy because it manipulates minds for its own benefit. But that's another story that we can have another time. Um, it's been absolutely delightful, Rick, to talk to you, full of wisdoms. We've gone over a huge number of areas about how we change the brain and how we change the world. Thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute privilege. Oh, Paul, thank you. And I, I hope we didn't go over long. And thank you for letting me uh, hop people, on my soapbox a bit did. here. People can listen to turn off as they wish. It's a democracy. Okay, that's right. Well, thank you again.